Hello, this is Waylon Chow, and this is the Constitution of Canada, Part 2. In this part, we'll look at the division of lawmaking powers. In Part 1, we talked about how the Constitution, or specifically the Constitution Act 1867, creates our federal system of government. So that government is made up of two levels. We have the national government, being the Parliament of Canada, and local or regional governments that we call provincial governments that, that each have a provincial legislature. To have that kind of system, we need rules that allocate specific lawmaking powers to each level of government. The allocation or division of lawmaking power in our federal system is determined by sections 91, 92, and 93 of the Constitution Act 1867. We'll first look at section 91, which allocates power to the federal parliament. So we'll first focus on the wording in the preamble of section 91. If we look at near the, near the top there, um, it refers to the Senate and the House of Commons. So those two legislative bodies make up the two parts of the federal parliament. So in Canada, for a federal statute to become law, the proposed legislation is, in the, is first in the form of a bill. The bill is first considered by the House of Commons, and if it's approved by a majority of the House of Commons, it moves on to the Senate. And if a majority of the Senate approves, it's still not law. It still has to go through one more step. step. It needs to be approved or assented to by the Queen or the Queen's representative in Canada called the Governor General. So that final step is called royal assent. So the reference to the Queen here is, is uh, to you know, the current uh, holder of the uh, English throne, which is uh, Queen Elizabeth II. So she is the Queen of England, but she also happens to be uh, the Queen of Canada. Canada is still a constitutional monarchy with the Queen as, as the head of state. So the, there is a legal requirement that every piece of legislation needs to be approved or assented to by the Queen or her representative before it becomes law. And that, and that consent is always provided. The, the other part of section 91 I wanted to point out to you is the, is the wording at the very end. Uh, which says the exclusive legislative authority of the Parliament of Canada extends to all matters coming within the classes of subjects next here and after enumerated. Uh, so that's just very fancy language, essentially saying that you know here here below there is a list of subject matter that is that that constitutes the powers of the federal Parliament. We're not going to look at every single federal lawmaking power under Section 91, but we'll, we'll point out some of the more significant ones, especially those that are important to the regulation of business. The first significant power is under Section 91.2, the regulation of trade and commerce. The thing to keep in mind with, with this power is that it is, it is applied in a much narrower sense than the wording suggests. Um, just saying trade and commerce seems to suggest that the federal government has the ability to regulate uh, almost any kind of economic, economic activity in Canada, which is actually not the case. The, the regulation of trade and commerce refers to uh, the federal government's ability to regulate international and interprovincial uh, trade. Uh, so any kind of economic, economic activity, any kind of trade within a province cannot be regulated by the federal parliament, but can be regulated on, by the provincial governments. So an example of an exercise of this power by the federal, uh, federal government you know, is the entering into of international trade treaties. Uh, you know, not too long ago, the, the NAFTA treaty uh, was revised uh, you know, through negotiations between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. So the revised treaty is called the Canada-United States-Mexico Agreement, or CUSMA uh, for short. Uh, the U.S. government likes to call it the USMCA. We like to call it CUSMA. Um, so that 
So that was done by the federal government in the exercise of their of their power to regulate trade and commerce. Section 912A uh, gives the federal government power over unemployment insurance. So that's why it's the federal government that administers the employment uh, insurance program. And by the way, the it used to be called unemployment insurance until about you know around the 1980s. Uh, the then federal government under Brian Mulroney renamed the uh, the program employment insurance. Section 913 uh, gives the federal parliament the ability to impose taxes. So the federal government in Canada uh, imposes uh, all kinds of different taxes, including uh, personal income tax, uh, corporate income tax, and a number of different uh, consumption taxes, including uh, the GST and HST. And you know, taxes are administered and collected uh, by a government agency, a federal government agency called uh, Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency or CRA for short. The Postal Service is the responsibility of the federal parliament under 91.5. Canada Post is a crown corporation owned by the federal government. The census and the collection of statistics is the responsibility of the federal government. The specific government department that uh, is responsible for this is called Statistics Canada. The power over navigation and shipping essentially refers to uh, any kind of transportation by water. So you know, boats and, and, and ships uh, on, on water. It can be uh, commercial shipping. It can also be uh, you know, pleasure, you know, boating. Like if you if you have a boat at the cottage, and you need a boating license, that license is obtained from the federal government. Currency and coinage is issued by the federal government through the institution called the Royal Canadian Mint. The banking industry is regulated by the federal government under 9115. The specific legislation is called the Bank Act and the government agency is the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions or OSFI for short. Bankruptcy and insolvency is regulated by the federal government. The relevant legislation is called the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. Legislation regulating intellectual property, including patents and copyrights, is the responsibility of the federal parliament. The, the federal government agency is called the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Immigration and citizenship is the responsibility of the federal government under section 9125, which refers to naturalization and aliens. The legal requirements to be married or to be divorced are set by the federal parliament. However, the rules governing the splitting of assets or the sharing of assets on a divorce or a separation are not federal, but they are set by each provincial government. Criminal law is the responsibility of the federal parliament under section 9127. The major piece of criminal law legislation in Canada is called the Criminal Code. Within the Criminal Code, you will find offenses for all the, the usual crimes that we're all aware of, uh, you know, uh, murder, kidnapping, uh, theft, and, uh, and, and, and some you know, business-related crimes, especially fraud. Um, so you will see all, all of the rules for those offenses uh, in, in the Criminal Code. The last federal lawmaking power I'll talk about is called the residual power. It may not sound you know, very interesting or important, but it actually is. The, the residual power arises from the wording in the preamble of section 95, which, I, which I've highlighted there, uh, which says, in relation to all matters not coming within the classes of subjects by this act, assigned exclusively to the legislatures of the provinces. So what the residual 
power is. So let me explain you know, what that wording you know, means, essentially, what the effect of that wording is, is that uh, if we sort of take a step back, uh, the Constitution Act 1867, or or the original act called the the BNA or British North America Act, well, you know, was you know was passed in 1867. Um, so the, the the people who wrote the uh, Constitution Act 1867 or BNA Act uh, realized that you know the world is a constantly changing place, and that you know they could you know they could try to list as many subject matter. You know, in the section 91, 92, 93, uh, that could capture all you know the various subject matter in the world that existed in 1867. Uh, but you know they realize that you know they there will there will be things that 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 will be created in the world that they would not be aware of the things that would arise in the future. So so the way they wrote they wrote the Constitution Act 1867 is is that if if there's some subject matter that is not listed you know in the constitution act if it's not in section 91 92 or 93 if it's not mentioned there then the power to regulate this unlisted subject matter uh, belongs to the federal parliament and we've come to call that power the residual uh, residual power some of the examples of the subject matter that falls within the residual po power that the federal government has uh, authority to regulate and actually does regulate uh, is uh, is air travel. Um, you know, airplanes and air travel, airports are all regulated by the federal government. Another another example of residual power is the regulation of. Uh, telecommunications uh, and broadcasting, uh, like TV stations, uh, cell phone uh, networks, all of that is regulated by the federal uh, federal government. And the the federal agency that regulates that, by the way, is called the the CRTC. Let's now look at the provincial lawmaking powers that are set out in the Constitution Act 1867. In Section 92. There is a list of subject matter that the provincial legislatures have responsibility over. One of the most important provincial lawmaking powers is found in section 9213, which refers to property and civil rights in the province. Now, it may not at first blush sound like much, but it actually is. Uh, this is the power essentially that gives provinces uh, the ability to regulate you know, most business transactions or, or, or the economy in general in each of the provinces. It gives them the ability, for example, to regulate uh, the stock market. Uh, the, the Toronto Stock Exchange is, is regulated by the Ontario government. Uh, any kind of uh, consumer or business transactions can be regulated under this power. So if we if we look at the words property and civil rights and understand what they mean, so property is essentially you know, any transaction dealing with property. Like for example, uh, if you are if you are buying a home, if you're buying real estate, the ownership of your home would be registered in a registry that is run by the provincial government. The other words in section 9213. Uh, is civil rights, and this is you know, these these words you know cause uh, some confusion. The the modern meaning of civil rights refers to human rights such as freedom of expression, uh, you know, right not to be detained uh, without proper reason, uh, freedom of religion. The the use of the term civil rights. Uh, in the Constitution Act 1867 does not refer to human rights. Uh, the, the meaning here is, uh, the best way to look at it is if you replace the word civil with private, private rights. So any situation that involves private legal rights. So that would include uh, contracts, contracts, 
uh, create legal rights between private parties. So essentially, uh, any situation involving a contract, a, a, a trans, an economic transaction, uh, could be regulated under 9213. Section 92.2 gives the provinces the ability to impose taxes. Uh, in Ontario, for example, uh, the government imposes a number of different taxes, including personal income tax, uh, corporate income tax, uh, sales taxes, including uh, HST. Another very important provincial power is the responsibility for hospitals and the healthcare system in general. We've been thus far talking a lot about our system of government being made up of the federal government and the provincial governments. But you may have been wondering where where do the municipal governments fit in? Where how are they how are they created? The Constitution itself, or Constitution Act 867, creates only the federal parliament and the provincial legislatures. The municipal governments, like uh, you know, City of Mississauga, uh, City of Toronto, they're all governed by their own city councils. Those municipal governments are created under this power, under 92.8, the power over municipal institutions in the province. So how that works is that each province has the right to create municipal governments. So let's say the city of Mississauga. The city of Mississauga and the city council uh, was created by a piece of legislation passed by the Ontario government. The Ontario government under that legislation gives the Mississauga city council certain powers to make laws and the city council will use those powers or we call them delegated powers uh, will we'll use those delegated powers to make bylaws so bylaws such as uh, uh, building requirements or parking uh, parking rules uh, that are that are created by by city governments The licensing of businesses, including liquor licenses, is the responsibility of the provincial government. Uh, in Ontario, if you have a restaurant, let's say, and you want to serve alcohol, you will need a liquor license. You would apply to the uh, Liquor Licensing Control Board of Ontario to get that license. If you have a business that operates only in Ontario, you can incorporate a corporation under provincial law. And this is under 9211, which gives the provinces the power to create legislation regarding the incorporation of companies with provincial objects. Section 9214 gives the provinces the responsibility for the, for the court system. And finally, there's a catch-all power under 9216, uh, which gives uh, provincial governments power over generally all matters of a merely local or private nature in the province. So that's essentially saying if it doesn't fit into any of the other uh, categories on the list or any other subject matter on the list, but it's still something that is uh, strictly about that province or within that province, then the province has the, the legal right to pass legislation regarding that matter. The last very significant power that provincial governments have under the Constitution Act 1867 is the power over education. And that stems from Section 93. So, so that includes uh, elementary schools, uh, high schools, uh, colleges, and universities. They are all regulated by the provincial government. So with all these division of power rules that we've looked at, how are they applied? If you remember from part one, we, we looked at section 52, or sub, 52 subsection one specifically of the Constitution Act 1867. It says that the Constitu Constitution of Canada is the supreme law of Canada, and that any law that is inconsistent with the Constitution is of no force or effect. So by applying that section, 
if we have a law that's been created by a government, it could be federal government, it could be provincial government, or even or even a municipal government. If the validity of that law is challenged, that law can be said to be either intravirus or ultravirus. So those are, are Latin terms. Intravirus means that the law was created within the scope of the government's authority. In other words, they had a legal right to create that law. Ultravirus it means that the law was created outside the scope of the government's authority, meaning the government did not have legal authority or legal right to make that law. So if a law is found to be intravirus, that law is held to be valid. If it's ultravirus, that law would be considered invalid. It's as if the law did not exist. Let's look at a specific case as an example. A long time ago, so this was uh, uh, you know, earlier uh, in the first half of the 20th century, um, there was, you know, there was butter and then came along a competing product uh, called margarine. And the, the people in the dairy industry, especially farmers, dairy farmers, uh, were very concerned that this new product, margarine, uh, would take away sales uh, from, from butter. So they were able to convince the government, the federal government in this case, uh, to pass legislation. Uh, so this legislation was called the Dairy Industry uh, Act. And, and under a, a particular section, section 5A, it says that no person shall manufacture, import into Canada, or offer, sell, or have in his possession for sale any margarine or other substitute for butter, basically banning uh, the, the manufacture, the importation, a sale, or possession of margarine, uh, basically making it an illegal substance, more or less. Um, so the validity of that legislation or this specific section uh, was challenged or, or was considered uh, by the Supreme Court of Canada in a case that was, uh, it, the decision was released in 1949. So the specific legal issue here was whether or not that section 5A uh, was ultra virus of the P Parliament of Canada now, either in whole or in part, and if so, what particular or particulars and to what extent. Um, in other words, uh, did the federal parliament have the legal rights under the Constitution Act 1867, which back then was called the BNA Act, did they have the legal right or legal authority to pass uh, Section 5A as a law? So the Supreme Court of Canada uh, rendered its decision here. They said that you know, banning the import of margarine is a valid exercise of federal power under the regulation of trade and commerce. Remember, trade and commerce is interpreted as giving the federal parliament the right to regulate interprovincial and international trade. So they said, okay, you can ban the import of margarine. That's a valid exercise of the federal government's power. But then the Supreme Court also said, banning the sale and manufacture of margarine is ultra virus of the federal parliament. In other words, federal par parliament does not have a right to ban the sale and manufacture of margarine because that concerns property and civil rights. And property and civil rights is a provincial power under section 92. So the federal parliament, so that part, that banning the sale and manufacture margin uh, was invalid. So they had no right, the federal parliament had no right to do that.